Hi guys, my name is Noel Mack, Chief Brand Officer or CBO here at Gymshark, and I'm also exec sponsor of our BAME group. Now the reason that's relevant is because in October, it's Black History Month here in the UK. And as a brand, we're trying to amplify black British voices. So I'm in the podcast studio today, surrounded by some amazing people, and we're gonna try and do that. So without any further ado, let's jump into the podcast. The transition from trampoline into athletics, I definitely feel at home. And sometimes I'll hear them talking about immigrants, and I wouldn't say anything. I didn't want to spend too much time in the sun. I'm lucky that I had someone to have looked up to. And I didn't know how to respond. Because mm. I'd be like, black. Dark. Yes. So dark yeah. and people would be like, whoa. Most people that watch my content are white. If I put too much of my own culture there, they can't relate to it. So Black History Month. Before we get into the what, the why, and what, you know, who's here with me today, I wanted to tell a little story from our band group here at Gymshark. Um, one of our staff recently said to me, as a black British female, I can count on one hand how many role models I have to look up to. Now that's a really difficult thing for myself to understand because as a white male, I, I'm inundated with stories of successful white males and potential role models I could look up to. But the silver lining around that cloud is I'm sat here today with five people who I genuinely, genuinely believe are adding to that list of uh, upcoming black role models. So. That's a, very, that's a very big built up introduction. So now I'm gonna throw it to some of the guys to introduce themselves. And I wanna start with Asha. Asha, introduce yourself for me. Hello, my name is Asha Phillip and I'm a GB Olympic sprinter. That's fair, I like that. Obi? <laughs> um, I am Obi Vincent and uh, I just do bicep curls for a living. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I love fitness and I love trying different aspects of fitness and uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I do. I feel like you want to sold yourself there. I feel like Obi, you are one of the most influential names in fitness. I've heard Obi referred to as Mr. Jim Jacques on many, many occasions. I'm sitting here with Olympic athletes, so there's no, <laughs> I'm just like, uh, yeah. yeah so no, thank you. I mean, that's my goal is to motivate people who aren't Olympic athletes and who do want to try different things in terms of fitness and yeah, and and, and enjoy it and have fun. That's pretty much cool, man. I like that. Yeah. Molly. My name is Molly Thompson-Smith. I'm a climber for GB. I've been climbing for 15 years. I'm 22, so a lot more time climbing than not. And yeah, so I climb rocks sometimes, yeah. um, <laughs> which sounds quite pointless, but it gives me great satisfaction. <laughs> and I do competitions on the World Cup circuit as well. Very nice. Global level. Yeah. <laughs> Joe? Um, I'm Joe Fraser. I'm a GB gymnast. I've been training since I was five years old. Spend the majority of my days upside down, <laughs> um, hanging off high bars and swinging off rings. So, yeah, very exciting. I believe as well, aren't you one of the, or the first black male gymnast to win a gold medal? Yeah, I'm the, I'm the first black male world champion. Nice. So, yeah. That's a statement, mate. Oh, the <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry about that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll try. Um, yeah, my name is Nathaniel Masayo. I'm from South London. And I do bodybuilding and powerlifting, also content creation. Um, I just like lifting heavy things. Um, I've always enjoyed bodybuilding. I actually started off doing gymnastics, uh, like Joe, but I found that the strength and conditioning aspect, I, even, I liked even better than gymnastics. So I continue with that and uh, just continue to get, just, you know, try to get bigger and stronger and that's, that's where I am today. And you're 17 years old now? Yeah, right? I'm 17 years old, yeah. 18 Impressive. next month. Impressive stuff. <laughs> <It helps. Yeah. laughs> Disclaimer. So, yeah. first question, and this came up just before the podcast, and I shouted at the guys and went, stop talking about it, is, what does Black History Month mean to you? Asha, I'm going to start with you. And the reason I'm going to start with Asha, by the way, there's a little story for the rest of you guys here, if you don't already know this, is I heard an anecdote that in LA, on a shoot a little while ago, <laughs> you posed this question to one of the staff at Gymshark, mm -hmm. and the staff member in question said to me, I felt so awkward, Asha asked me this question, mm -hmm. I didn't know what to say, I didn't know what to say, so I thought you'd be the ideal person to ask that first. What does Black History Month mean to you? Uh, to me, I feel like it's a celebration of black people because I feel there's a lot of struggles that we have to endure throughout our whole entire lives. Mm -hmm. And to know that we at least get one month that we can actually talk about it. And so if my nephew or niece come back from school and said, oh, we learned about so-and-so today, it makes me feel proud that they learned something and they know that there are people they can look up to. Because I don't know, for me personally, being a black woman, especially from London, like there, there have been a few struggles but to see that we actually get to celebrate it, or just acknowledge that there are black people here and we do work hard and we are overlooked, I think it's a very good feeling for me, should I say. So you say your niece and nephew? Yes. So, did, so you talk, I think you're talking about them being educated in black history while they were at school during the month, right? Yeah. Did you have that while you were at school? I did, yes. You did? 
Yeah, and to be honest, it's quite, I, quite fun, I find it funny <laughs> because obviously I don't see myself, okay, I, I, if you all know I'm crazy to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah, but definitely. <laughs> all for the good reasons. <laughs> but when I get asked to go to schools and they want me to speak on black history and they're like, oh my God, they're looking up to me. I'm like, you guys, are you sure? Like, do you know me personally? But it's good when I tell my story because I feel like I have a, 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 a lot to say. Um, especially with my injury and just how I started from, was it trampoline into athletics and all the other sports that I've done. So when I go in and talk to um, kids about it, and I, they, when I leave, I always get um, a call from the teacher saying that oh, they were really inspired and stuff like that. And it's such a good feeling because had I had someone come into my school and I can look at that person thinking, I'm gonna, one day I'm going to be like you, because I can see that. Because you can't be what you can't see or you don't know what you can't see. And every time I, like, if I'm watching TV or something, I think, oh, you know what, I like that, I'm going to go do that. So if someone, if I've touched one person in that class, I feel great for it. Because some kids even cry and I'm like, oh, not for me. I'm, I'm not the one you want to cry about. <laughs> but um, when you've had that feeling, it's just like, wow. I f like touching someone makes like the massive difference for me. And that's what I like about black history because I would like go to different places and like tell my story or listen to other people's stories. And I just feel like we need this more often. There's a, that, that, there's a, there's a there's a gem in what, what you just said there, that mm -hmm. thing, you can't, you can't be what you can't see. Yeah. Like I feel like if, to take anything away from that little bit you said there, that is the sort of the key line. I really like that. When we were talking about this before, your understanding slash appreciation of Akis was really different, Obi, right? Yes. Um, I honestly didn't even know we had Black <laughs> History Month in the UK. I know we had, we, I know the America, there's a Black History Month in America, and I could tell you a lot about Black History in America, in the UK, not so much, and um, and so I, I am an immigrant. So um, I was born in Nigeria. I was born here. So uh, in school, like you said, you learned a lot about Black history. Not re I didn't at all. Actually, I don't even remember. Um, a lot of things I've learned now is because of I had to Sorry, do. Sorry, how research. old were you when you came from Nigeria? I was about 10, 10, 11. So that's a long time. And the, and you're saying <laughs> the, the lack of education there wasn't. In Nigeria, it was it was when you were at school here. It was here. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. in Nigeria, we learnt a lot about <laughs> Britain and everything else. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, here in school, uh, nothing. Not really. The history was the World War. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, we learned about Egypt and um, some parts of the Middle East. But uh, yeah, the, I can't remember. The only time I knew actually vaguely about Black history was when Channel Four would do programs. But yeah. I just thought they were just doing programs because Channel Four <laughs> decided that they, because Channel Four, you know, Channel Four always does diverse programming yeah, 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 sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't know we had a whole month of it. So when when you see when he even says that, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, I feel, I, in a way, it's 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 bad or it's sad. Um, you don't know what you don't know, though, right? You can't be blamed for that. Yeah, I, and also I think because as a black man, I always feel like because I'm already living in. I'm living it in a way. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like I'm learning about other cultures because I feel like I'm here in England. I'm kind of already living, being a black man. Um, so yeah, American history, I could tell you so much about black American history, but the UK, not so much. Which Interesting. Is yeah. So really different experiences. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we might learn it in school, but I understand the fact that it wouldn't be like in depth or in anything. Depth, no. yeah, yeah. Like you'd get the one person to pick and talk about her mm. for the whole entire uh, month. It wouldn't be like that. Yeah, yeah. So I understand. So you still got the world wars and all yeah, the usual. Yes. Of course we yeah, like yeah. we in, in school, we I knew about Mandela, but but that's yeah. learning in school. Um, Malcolm Malcolm X, uh, things like that. It was more a, a lot of the American history. Um, yeah, it, it it was very very rare to learn about the black. British history. I mean, I know about Liverpool and the slave trade, mm -hmm. but again, I had to learn that more in depth because one of my friends is from Liverpool. She's Nigerian. I told you Nigerians everywhere. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's from Liverpool. She has a thick Liverpoolian accent and she was teaching me so much about the slave history of Liverpool, but I didn't learn a lot of that. So you school. were getting that from friends and outside of the, the yeah. institution? Kind yeah, of. because when I heard I was working in Selfridges and she had such a thick Liverpool, because when you meet a black person with an accent that's if from Liverpool or from Scotland. I have a friend, Birmingham. she's mixed, but yeah. But, oh. Joe, and, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> so, no, so for me, I'm always fascinated by that. I'm just like, your accent, you know, yeah. so even though I'm Nigerian with, but it's just interesting to hear different accents. And when we became friends and I was just like, what is it like living in Liverpool? And she was like, she's, because I was very nice. I've never been to Liverpool. I'm mm -hmm. thinking, oh God, you must be hard being black. She's like, no, it's actually, 
it's actually diverse where she is in Liverpool, but she was telling me why there's a lot of black people yeah, in Liverpool. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. didn't know this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I had a similar experience at school. Like, it was almost like black history didn't exist until October, and then mm. out comes Roots, yeah. the film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. That yeah. was That's it. Just I, a classic. Yeah, yes. like, yeah. I'm pretty sure, I can't remember, but I don't think there was a single black teacher at my school, or maybe oh, there wow. was, but to teach, like, black history and history or what other subjects do you have, like, PSHE or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I felt like my teacher didn't feel qualified enough or felt a bit awkward to yeah, yeah. talk about black That's history. Like so it was like, yeah, just whack this film on, you guys just, you know, pay attention. Mm -hmm. And that is all I remember of black history from school and I find that quite disappointing, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. And was school the, the school the first place you would have seen Roots? Yeah. Or would you have seen it prior to that? No, I, I only watched it at school. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I watched it at school as well. Like it, every it, year. It seemed like it came on every year. <laughs> <laughs> it, it took out however many hours of the, the month for the teacher to do his black history. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, if, I guess I'm a bit mixed. I felt like, obviously, I was appreciative that we got the month to like look at your Rosa Parkses and your people that have actually done so much for black history. But then, on the other hand, there's you've got 11 other months where you're not talking about anything, so it's it's a bit iffy, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Like, you're, you're, well, I'm yeah. you're in school right now, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm in school right now. <laughs> How old does that make everybody else in? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. I haven't done my A-levels yet, but I, th I think that the, um, the black British experience is very different depending on where you are. Yeah. So where I live in South London, the UK is probably what, like three or 4% black, but I can say that both the schools I went to, primary and secondary and sixth form, have been at least 50% black mm -hmm. um, because of where I am in South London. So the experience that I've had of Black History Month, I'd say has been pretty good and there's been a decent emphasis on it because of the people who are at the school and the representation. Um, but I can say, for example, my cousins that moved to Margate, you know, there were people at the, their school that were calling them monkey and stuff at school. So there's not gonna be a lot of Black History Month at a school where you've got literally other racist yeah, yeah, yeah. children. So the, the, the experience that you have is very dependent on like where you are and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, I feel like with Black History Month, it's, it's gonna be automatic that in the UK, the, the most of the history you're learning is going to be about white people because again, the UK is only like three or four percent black. So I do think it is important to have time where we do learn about like black people and things like that. But I don't know, I feel, it can feel a bit forced because we don't learn about it in any other, you know, in, like any other time other than Black History Month. Um, but I have seen a little bit of a change though recently in terms of emphasis on black history in just the general curriculum. So I do history right now mm -hmm. and we have a whole, um, you know, curriculum on the civil rights movement. That's, that's one of the things we're tested on, the civil rights movement in America. Um, and so that may not have been the case when, you know, you guys were probably at school. So I've seen a little bit of a change though, to be honest, in like just general history, but it's still majority white, but mm -hmm. yeah. But the thing is, uh, like you just said, America. So yeah, a lot of times we learn about black history, it's America. Yeah. Mm. Like you, if you ask a lot of people how many, name two black historical figures off your head right now, it will be Martin Luther King and Malcolm. Rosa Parks, Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. Ask them about the in, in, no, British, no, no, no. someone British. Just start stuttering. Yeah. <laughs> it goes back to what I mentioned at the start, right, with when I was talking to uh, one of the girls who said that she's counting on one hand black British females that she can look up to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm saying that, to count on one hand, she's probably gone out of her way and researched, right? Because like we said, like you just said there, it went very quiet when you asked yeah. for just black British people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's something that people, I've talked to my friend, a lot of my, like that, what your point was absolutely valid because where I grew up, I grew up in near, um, opposite to Docklands, even though it was called Rotherhive, but it wasn't because Rotherhive, there's, there's, and Bermondsey have this like reputation, mm -hmm. but I wasn't in that part. I was in a part where there was no one around and it was predominantly middle-class families. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people around were white, so my school was predominantly white. So I, um, my experience is going to be different from someone who grew up in Croydon, Brixton, and uh, it's it's funny because I still do remember the first time someone did say, uh, you know, use the N words. I've been calling N words mm -hmm. just for years ago, mm -hmm. and you don't. A lot of people I have had to say to my explain to my friends. I'd never said this before to them, but it does happen. Just because you don't see it, doesn't mean it's mm -hmm. not there. You know, so um, I think that's a lot of the things that we need to, uh, we, if 
in a way, if you don't tell people, they're ignorant. That's why I always say some people are ignorant. So you might not know it happens. Like you, when she told you, you were like, wow, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. It's because you, you didn't know. Why mm -hmm. would you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, in a, it, why would you? Mm -hmm. that's, that's another thing with the UK. It's very um, polarizing how, um, you know, racism is in different parts of the country. It's very different in different parts of the country. So where I grew up, again, in like South London, Croydon, um, you're not going to find much racism because there's a lot of black people mm -hmm. there. But again, same story. When I go to see my cousins, I remember we went to an arcade and I was like seven years old, something like that. We were walking back from the arcade and these two white guys just shouted the N-word at us <sighs> as we were walking home. And I remember that happened when I was seven. I was like proper confused at what was going on because where I grew up, none of that stuff was happening. Plus I was pretty young. So yeah, when you go to different parts of the UK, it's a completely different experience. And you're always having to kind of navigate that and just have that in the back of your mind. Like, well, when I go to this part of the UK, there could be people there that mm -hmm. genuinely don't like black people. Mm -hmm. So that is a crazy thing to deal with. You have to act a certain type of way. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Extra. Yes. Oh, sorry, yeah. it's my fault. You know. <laughs> a lot of times when you see an older white person, you have to act extra yeah. like yes. um, non-threatening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because a lot of times, like, when they just see me as a young black guy, mm. I, I can actually just see fe like fear in their eyes a lot of yes. times. When yeah. I, if I get on a train and they're sitting yeah. there, like if I need to sit next to them, it's a bit of a weird look. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so that's just something you just have to... You say extra non-threatening. Yeah. As, yes. as though you were going to be threatening at all. <laughs> what? So what does, I, I mean, what, what does extra non-threatening look like? Is it, you know, really big smiles? Yeah, I, I yeah. usually have to smile. Don't even talk to them. It's about, it's about, if they did pre that. It's <laughs> about how pre we're presented. So someone like me, a young black male from South London, mm -hmm. in the media, I'm presented as the person who's doing most of the stabbings, who's in gang violence and things like that. So the perception of me is going to be, I'm one of those people. Those are the people that are shown in the media. Mm -hmm. So when people see someone that looks like me, that's what they think of, they because that's what that. they've been seen. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what they've been shown. So if I want to kind of like, you know, make it so that I don't look like, I've got to like, you know, put on a smile, be proper, try to be proper nice. And that's like, um, it's different for, for black males particularly. Mm -hmm. Black women have their struggles also, but I'd say in the recent years with like stabbings and things like that, like black, young black males in South London are, have been really stereotyped and things like that. So, yeah. So, shifting gears a little bit, there was something else you said and I, I wanted to store it so I could bring it back <laughs> later. But you said the thing about you going to schools and being like, you know, the whole thing about you can't be what you can't see. Mm -hmm. You had, somebody to look up to in gymnastics, right? When you when yeah. you were early into gymnastics. You want to talk to me about that a little bit? Yeah, so obviously early on in my career, in my gym, there wasn't really anyone, there, well, there wasn't anyone I could look up to. Mm -hmm. And even on the world stage, really, there's, there's not really many black gymnasts, mm -hmm. like male black gymnasts. So having someone like Lewis Smith, who was doing as much as he did um, throughout his Olympic career, as a, seven eight nine year old boy watching him on the telly that really does tell you it's doable work hard like you can you can actually get get to where you want to be kind of thing and i feel like if i didn't have that potentially i might have looked at other other mm -hmm. avenues i might have thought oh this clearly isn't isn't for me this isn't isn't mm -hmm. a direction that i am meant to be going in mm -hmm. so let me try something else so i feel i felt the responsible responsible now to try and be that positive role model for the, the next generation. This is what I was thinking, I thought, did that so. then inherently put a pressure on your shoulders to be, for the seven, eight year old out there right now who's watching, looking at you, thinking that there's the guy, I can be him? Definitely, like the kid, like the young athletes in my gym, I try my, my best to be that hard working athlete that they can look up to and say, you know, I, I do want to be like Joe when I'm, when I'm 15, 20, however old they are. So I guess, be, you know, you, you feel, a pressure moving forwards and I am I'm grateful that I, I'm lucky that I had mm -hmm. someone to have looked up to so well, I feel like now that's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. Molly did you have the same thing? Did I you have somebody you could look at? No the climbing community is is predominantly white and male and I think if the stereotype for climbers is you know old guys who walk up a mountain yeah. or like go and live in a cave, a bit dirt baggy and like very free spirited. And I started climbing. I had a birthday party when I was seven, which is where I started climbing. And I am so grateful for my, my dad and my mum because I think without them, I would not have carried on. Like my dad drove me everywhere around the country to trainings and competitions and he's sporty and he really like supported me through all that. But I, I really had no one to look up to within climbing. Like even now in 2020, I can count 
the amount of professional World Cup black climbers on one hand, which is kind of crazy. Um, and I had to take my inspiration from other sports like Dame Kelly Holmes and Jess Ennis Hill, who I looked up to. Um, and I just never really felt like I fitted in in the climbing world, but I think I was lucky because I was so young and I was just like, yeah, sport, climbing, I love it. Like, was finding motivation from myself. Mm. And, and people always ask me like, who are your role models in climbing? And I say myself because I was the only person like there for me when I was younger. I couldn't like see myself or find a connection with anyone else in the climbing world. And so my goal is to try and, you know, diversify climbing and like be that person for any young person to look up to. to Cause like Asha said, like, it's really hard to find a connection with something you can't see or like, especially in sport. I think if there's no one like you, it's really easy to just like go and find another one where mm -hmm. there are tons of people where you feel comfortable. So yeah, that's my goal. And it actually, I didn't really realize how much it affected me over the last 15 years until I went climbing with a group called Climber and mm -hmm. they're like a community for um, black and ethnic minorities like to start climbing. And I literally had to pick my jaw up off the floor when I saw five black climbers in a climbing wall. And then there were more and there were 15 of us and I had the best session out of like all of my 15 years of climbing. And I felt so comfortable and I was like, wow, I really went 15 years feeling like, it was like this skin had just like come off of me and I like could be myself and like, yeah, my hair was crazy and curly and it was like normal and it was like, I didn't realize until that day, I was like, wow, that was kind of draining those last 15 years, like trying to be someone else when I was younger and then like finally accepting who I was like a bit older. And then like, yeah, being totally comfortable for the first time at a climbing wall, somewhere where I spend every day of my life. So it was quite an experience. And that's, that's I feel like that's a whole nother added pressure, right? Because well, I'm trying to remember the phrase, you can't be what you can't see, right? Or if you can't beat, you can't, you can't, if you can't see it, you can't beat, right? Mm -hmm. You're having to be like a pioneer and sort of, yeah, well, that's true. I'm going to have to ignore that and just try and blaze a trail anyway. Do you know what I'm saying? But like Joe said, you're probably opening the doors behind you for a lot of other people to follow along in your footsteps. Yeah, I really hope so. Like, for me, it's worth all the, like, comments I got when I was younger, the digs, like, the stairs, like, being worried about what I was wearing or my hair, just to hope that, like, someday some young girls and guys can, like, see that there's a place for them in the climbing community because it is awesome. I love the sport. And I mostly love the people, but yeah, I just hope that they see that there's a space for them there. Do, do you know, I feel that because I did trampolining before I did athletics. And I felt like my family was the only black family in, in terms of the whole entire arena. <laughs> and that feeling is just like, I don't know, you, you can't put it into words because like you said, we brought up, I've been brought up in a very diverse area and I've not known anything else until I've been put, my whole family, so me and my cousins and my brother have just been there. <laughs> You look around and think, okay, this is just us then. So um, <laughs> how's this going to work? And the thing is, you change completely. You're never going to be yourself. And you do get the stares, you do get the looks, and they have the sly comments that you just have to take on the chin. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget when um, it was at training one day, and they just, uh, they just oh, so do you guys say, oh, like, how do you say um, you're going to buy a loaf of bread? I'm thinking, what language do you think I speak? <laughs> like, do you know I mean? like, I'm from London. I don't, maybe, I don't know, because you thought it was East End or we spoke with a um, slang or something, but they always assume something and I just you could never honestly be yourself and every time you go away on camps and stuff you have to always act a certain type of way because I'm um, growing up I never was able to stay around um, anyone's house my mom didn't allow it mainly the fact because she didn't know the parents you ain't getting there <laughs> but then even still it's like if you set stayed at someone else's house who isn't of your colour or your culture, they're always going to think that you might steal something, you might do this, you might know, do that mm -hmm. so you couldn't even sleep good at night anyway. So now you've got to share a room with someone if on a camp and they're not black and obviously I got a bit of a head wrap on and like, there's all different types of things that I do. You know, I, I cream my skin and like I do, you know, my, my washcloth, I use one. And then it's like you get asked a hundred questions. I'm like, in my mind, I feel like, doesn't everyone do this? Don't you cream your skin? Mm -hmm. Don't you use a washcloth? That kind of thing. I thought, because I think the way how I live is how everyone should be living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, people don't understand it. And honestly, there's been so many times you just, you really have to sit back and just not say nothing. So I could be in a room like this and there's people just making digs and digs and you just have to take it on the chin. I feel, I, when I look back at it, I feel so sorry for my parents. It's for them to travel all up and down the country to deal with that nonsense every mm. day. And obviously we were young, we, weren't, we couldn't see it, but we, could, we, could feel, we, we knew. 
But like, we always get that talk, okay, guys, make sure you do this, don't do that. So why has my mum got to tell me how to act before I go into a building when there's going to be loads of kids running around and having so much fun, but we can't do that because it's always going to be a, a hoo-ha or something if we were there. But looking back now, you must realise it, it would have been so much uh, more sort of salient to your parents. Like, they'd have been so much more aware of it because, mm -hmm. like you said, I was just loving climbing, or I was just a yeah. kid climbing, or I was just wanting to do the trampoline or but whatever I wish else it I was. Knew. Yeah, yeah. Because then but I It's only looking back now that like, yeah. you realise quite how, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, all, all the all social things that were going mm -hmm. on there. Obviously, in the more bodybuilding, YouTube, that kind of world, mm. did you have, is, is, is that the same thing? Because what we're talking about here is sort of like, sort of athletic prowess, right? And sort of, you know, superstar athletes and all that kind of stuff. Was there a, was there a similar situation in terms of like, you know, did, did you see other black people uh, vlogging on YouTube around, you know, the fitness and bodybuilding? I think, um, I can't even remember um, anyone because Simeone also was still fairly new. And every time you saw him fitness, they would always just use Simeone, Simeone yeah, yeah, or yeah, yeah, Ulysses. Yeah. Simeone or Ulysses. It's like Samuel L. Jackson, but, you know, when it's Samuel L. Jackson was in every movie. Yeah. Um, and Those guys were like what Molly's doing right now in climbing, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, so I didn't. I Speak actually, you up a little bit there, man. <laughs> um, this is probably the honest truth. I didn't think, and uh, my family didn't want me to do any of this. My friend, I remember, I will never forget this in Dubai. My close friend was just like, you're wasting your time. There's no other black person. You're an immigrant, first of all. Your name's Obi. <laughs> you, you know, this is... This is not a career. This is not a job. You're not going to... I never thought I'd be signing to Gymshark, and that's the honest truth. Um, I You've didn't, been with us for I'll, four years? Yeah, right? yeah. So I didn't really see any other... Was there, No, there wasn't any other black guy I could look up, look up to. And I'm just, I'm saying that now. I remember saying this to George. And I was thinking, there's no way I'll get the subscribers because they're not going to follow me, you know, when they have all the, the Steve Cooks of the world. Um, and it almost felt like you... <sighs> I had to struggle five times as hard just mm -hmm. to get seen and to get noticed. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I didn't, I honestly didn't think that I would be doing this and sitting here. That's why I said to, um, uh, when Sam emailed me to part of Gymshark, I thought it was a, I thought it was a scam email because they used to do that, you used to get yeah, scam yeah, emails. Yeah. And I ignored it until I was like, just answer it. And um, yeah, it was a shock to the system. So that's, it, it is, I always say to people now coming up, I'm like, I wish that I, the social media was the way it is Wait, now yeah, when yeah. I started, because I was a lot more discouraged. Like I started YouTube and gave, I gave up after a year. Um, I've shared this story before, because I didn't, apart from Simeon, and I felt like Simeon and Ulysses were the only two that were allowed. I don't know. It's, For it's some a, reason they had a pass. It's a weird yeah, thing in, yeah, in, yeah. in the black yeah. community. It's like people always, they, and then you get compared to them. Mm. It's like nobody compares Steve Cook to David Lay because they're two completely different people. Mm. But we're black people, they compare us all the time. It's yeah. like, oh, he's not Simeone. We're not, you know, it's not Simeone. Simeone's better. Ulysses is better. But I'm not even Simeone. We're some completely different people. Yeah, yeah. Why can't we have more than two? Mm. You know, so, and if you ask people, I do this all the time, even with my friends, name other, apart from Simeone and Ulysses, name other people. Obviously, don't, not myself. Name other big black British names in the industry, even now. Silence. So it is, when the young ones are coming out, I get messages like this all the time, well, how, how did you do it? How did you do it? It just seems so impossible. I'm like, try, sometimes I say, to them, it's not the best advice. I was like, I think I was just lucky. Cheers. <laughs> 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 yeah. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to know your story, because you said you started at 14, I couldn't have done that. So I, when I started at 14, it was not fitness. Mm. I actually, oh, this is, I don't even want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> my channel, you're going to be, my channel was on hair. Oh, my right. Was on hair. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I had this I had this long curly hairstyle. In fact, I posted a transformation video the other day, put a um, picture. Yeah. Where I had my hair in cane rose and a man bun. Like mm. I I was full on the hair thing. Yeah. And people always ask me questions on like how I got my hair curly and stuff, because it was a really popular hairstyle with like black guys like a couple of years ago. You know the curly high top? Mm. Guys were like using the the, the sponge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, the sponge. Yeah. <laughs> that took him back then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so um with me, I would say for bodyboarding in particular. I didn't think there were many barriers for black people because I think about half of the Mr. Olympia winners mm, yeah. have actually are actually black. Okay. So that, that's a yeah, that's kind of cool. But in terms of like content creation, for me, it wasn't so much being black. Although 
most of the people that I looked up to, yeah, this is a funny story, were, were like white people and stuff like that, yes. like David Lane and things like that. Uh, that's why I said it was funny because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, way, yeah. But, um, what he's talking about there, real quick, <laughs> yeah. is because when we first met, oh, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was winding him up earlier saying that he came up to me at a Gymshark event like a fanboy like, with his camera and he was like, oh, I'm a big fan of David Lade and he was oh all like nervous gosh. and now he's sitting in the big seat, so anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen, but <laughs> anywho, <laughs> anywho, yeah. So it's, it was more about just being a black guy from South London doing it. It wasn't so much just about my race. It was more about like where I'm from because I have the, like me going to school now, I, I'm, actually, I'm actually able to see a lot of the younger students at my school that actually watch my content and they come up to me in school like, oh, I was watching your videos, you really inspired me and stuff like that. So I'm actually able to like see the effect like every day because I'm in school with the people who are like watching a lot of my videos and mm -hmm. stuff. So for me, it, it seems like um, they didn't even know that was an option for them, like doing that and um, having that as an option because the other black British YouTubers are often just doing general stuff. There's not a lot of them for, you, for fitness and even fitness in general with British people. In terms of younger guys, I can think of me and Joe Fazer that are like, you know, properly doing it and stuff like that. And I can't think of many like younger guys. Whereas in America, you've got Lex, Loads. Anthony, James, a ton, mm, of, yeah. ton of younger guys. So I think it's just like trying to be like a trailblazer for British, you know, content creators and things like that. And you've also got to, it's also been hard to like incorporate my own culture in my content because most of the people who I've watched are like incorporated their culture. But, but when I saw um, a fitness video, I thought that that was just how you were meant to be in it. Like they were putting the music that they wanted to hear in their videos and things like that. And I almost thought like, if you're gonna make a music, a fitness video, you've got to put you this style of music, kind of music or yeah, you've yeah, got yeah, to yeah. use this kind of slang terminology. I yeah, thought yeah, that yeah. just came, came with it. So I've also, it's also been a struggle for me to put my own culture into it. And because like a black people, black young males are even a minority of the people who are watching my content. Most people that watch my content are white. It's also been hesitant there because if I put too much of my own culture there, they can't mm -hmm. relate to it. And that's going to be alienating yourself from your main audience. It was going to be white people because the UK is mostly white. Mm -hmm. So it's always a struggle there to kind of involve your own culture in your content creation. But that's something I'm trying to do more and more as I go along. So, but yeah. I feel like that I was, I, I know what you mean. And I felt like when I first saw Arms Corleone or Arms Corleone, however you yeah. pronounce that it's bit, joke, on Instagram, yeah. it was the first time I'd seen somebody who was obviously a fitness dude, but not doing it in the way that the other fitness no, guys have done and, and really imprinting his own thing onto that. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? The banter and the, the skits with Little Man and Munya and those yeah. sorts of guys. Do you know what I'm saying? I hadn't seen that before. And so, you, yeah, you can really see his Ghanaian culture coming out. Big yeah. time, yeah, 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 yeah big time. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it is, um, like you said, I talked about this on YouTube where I did say my audience is predominantly white, probably 80%. And it took me a while to even say I was an immigrant. And a lot of people think Obi's from Star Wars. And then I had to actually correct that. That's what I did on Instagram. Like, Obi is actually a Nigerian name. It wasn't from Star Wars. Um, uh, it's, it took me a while to even say that I wasn't born in the UK. And yeah, I'm, you know, I have a Nigerian passport at some time. And I said, that people are like, what? But um, yeah, it, it is. I mean, I think also the difference is when I was in Nigeria, we went to schools that were it was a British school, mm -hmm. so, and our dad did not want us to have accents. He didn't even want us to understand, like, because I'm Igbo, so he didn't want us to understand that. He yeah. only speak English, because he always wow. sends us up. It's one of those things, it's quite elitist. So um, this is when the whole thing about privilege comes into play. I talked about how, yes, there's white privilege, but there is also black privilege. So a lot of people, when I say I was born in Nigeria, they think, oh God, slums. <laughs> I'm like, no, my life is completely different. If I probably stayed, I'll probably have a better life. Um, I wouldn't have worked in retail and stuff like that because my dad, he shipped us all off to boarding school. So, and I just didn't like that life. So um, my mom brought me here and it's, it, it was one of those situations where, you know, I, when I moved over here, I didn't have to really do that much in terms of, I just still have to hide the way I spoke and hide that I was from Nigeria. So sometimes I would never even mention it. And my mum gave me, this is one thing, um, it's quite funny, I have a Bible name because my mum gave me a Bible name because she was, a, which is a normal name. And she was like, just in case, we'll put, we'll, 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 we'll use this because Obi, I wouldn't, I, would, I didn't use Obi in school because I thought Obi was too Nigerian and I didn't want to be bullied. Um, my dad's surname though is what I use and Jesus Christ. Like whenever the teacher had to pronounce it, I was just like, oh God, no. And um, yeah, it, it is, it's 
on YouTube, I remember it was only this year that I fully talked about that where I'm from, who I am, and then I don't at know what if age, you, what are you. How old are you now? I'm thirty. I'm in my thirties now, so thirty-two now. So um, I'm old. You didn't say thirty-two straight away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm thirty. Yeah. 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 Ye
not everyone's going to go to the Olympics exactly. or like mm. train at an elite level full time every mm. day. And I find like you're very inspiring because you can appeal to so many mm. people and teach people that like you don't have to be amazing. Like yeah, you just have fitness to enjoy is for the everyone process. at every yes. level. Yeah. And it like it doesn't matter like where you are on your journey. Just the fact that you're on the journey is yeah. good enough. So but I mean, that's don't the thing. Talk is, about yourself like no, that. no. I mean, it, <laughs> I'm very hard on myself. But like, I find inspiration from everywhere, though. That's the fun part for me. I can look at what all of you do and think, oh, that's really cool. I can, you know, try the sprinting was a disaster. My deadlift's not great. I did the gymnastics. I'm doing the I'm doing the bouldering. I'm not constricted to just doing the one thing. Mm -hmm. And I also like want to share that with people. So especially young black creators who are finding it hard because there isn't that many of us. Mm -hmm. If you looked actually at the UK scene, there's not that many. If you looked at Americans and actually in, in the UK, if you look at a lot of the content creators in America, there's loads of other, you know, black creators you can look up to. But in the UK, isn't that many. But I still think, although yes, there's, you know, you can learn sports from these guys, you can do things with them. Mm -hmm. There's so much that you can teach like traditional athletes mm -hmm. as well. Let's talk about like, um, well, you know what, actually, talking about like black British creators, having, given the fact it was like last week, you can't talk black British creators right now without talking about Chunks and Philly, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, tell me you didn't feel that hug, do you know what I'm saying, <laughs> when you scored that goal. And now Chunks is what, signed to Sky, Sky Sports? Sports. Yeah. And he's, he's been like a pundit, right? Philly's like got his own show as well, I feel yeah. like I read somewhere. Those guys are absolutely crushing it. Now go back to what you said, right? Tell me their thing. Tell me the thing that they're really great at. Mm. Nothing. Yeah. They ask awkward questions outside Stratford mm. like this, and yeah. just make people laugh. Right? Yeah. But I think the, the, the idea of celebrity and, you know, uh, mm. I don't know, authority coming from you must have achieved something. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, all the football pundits right now are ex-footballers, right? So that was the old way things used to work. Now Chunks is sitting on the same sofa yeah. Reporting on the same football mm. because he was asking stupid questions outside yeah. Stratford. Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? That's, like, that's the new wave. And I think... Uh, KSI, Logan Paul, like being, you know, getting paid more than a lot of some of the best boxers in the world prove that mm -hmm. what you do is just as valuable as what, you know, a professional mm -hmm. boxer would do. And like Ryan Garcia, right, let's talk about another Gymshark yeah. athlete. He's this hybrid thing of a phenomenal athlete and boxer who's done the traditional thing, but also he's arguably an even better social media marketeer. Do you know what yeah. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And the whole fast punching thing and the body shot challenge that mm -hmm. he does. Some of the people he's hanging out with, he's got like OBJ and LeBron commenting on his posts. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, for me, that's the, 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 the if, if I was an athlete today and I'm in training camp and I've got my nutritionist and I've got my physios and I've got my whatever else, a, a hard part of my regime would also be right, two hours on content creation every day or just spending two hours scrolling, seeing what's working for other influencers out there and seeing how I could use what they're doing in their content to bring it to my world because Eddie Hearn, right, he, he, he is the, the, the business. He's the one who's going to pay the checks and stuff like that. He's saying, listen, I don't care how they're popular. As long as they're popular, if it makes yeah. money, I'm a promoter. I'm here to promote. I'll make it happen. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So I think Conor McGregor was another one like that, right? Like he was a, he skipped through the UFC and became oh, one of the biggest the stars in MMA mm. because of, he was good on Instagram and there was funny quotes and all that kind of stuff that he was able to do. Do you know what I mean? So I think you could be just as sort of useful to these guys and can add just as much value as a legitimate athlete mm. could to you, if that makes sense. I, yes, hold on. I was going to say, um, there will ne probably never be a time when people don't, aren't going to look up to your sprinters, gymnasts and like climbers and like people going to like admire them. But I think it's like, say with gymnastics, right? Because there's probably thousands and thousands of kids that like at age five start with doing gymnastics. Mm. But then it goes all the way up and then you have like people that you at the top. Mm. So in the past, it was only those people who got um, exposure because it was, you know, it was the proper TV companies mm -hmm. who was giving you guys, you know, TV time and things like that. But then all the people underneath that, you know, before, before YouTube and stuff like that, there was nothing for them. So I think that now, um, with YouTube and things like that, that's a platform for the people that don't quite make it in the traditional way can use to actually um, look up to something because you know not everyone actually can obviously be a sprinter not everyone's going to be an olympic athlete but i think everyone everyone can improve their own fitness and things like that and that's why you know what for example obi doing has re resonates with people so much because he's this guy that's not necessarily doing anything specific but he's just doing fitness and a lot of people just want to be fit um so i think having both of them in the industry is really important because you know you're always going to want to look up to a world-class sprinter a world-class gymnast world-class climber but then you know that you yourself aren't going to be that mm -hmm. so you also want someone that you can look up to who's doing something that you can like, actually relate to so i think it's very cool that we've got 
all those people in the industry right now, and always like also all those people on Gymshark. So that's really cool. Yeah. That's, uh, that's yeah. probably my favourite thing about the internet: the fact that the internet made it like a democracy instead mm -hmm. of a dictatorship, mm -hmm. right? So back mm -hmm. in the day, to become famous or popular or anything. A corporation, a TV network, or a record label, or somebody had to go. You know what? Yeah, we'll put you on. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? We'll make you a star. The internet meant that you just do your thing in your bedroom with your camera, and if people dig it, then you become a star. Yeah, you right? get to. It's the same in the fitness side, and it's probably going to be the same for you guys. So magazine covers, for example. I was talking about this exact subject where I don't know how many magazine covers have you seen people like yourselves in front of, especially for your sport, mm. um, and you just feel like. In the in the fitness side, you just feel like well, also how, how, that would never happen because you never, mm. you we never see people like ourselves in front of magazines in the specific things that we do, so men's health and stuff like that. If we do see it's celebrities, mm. but you know, av you know, people like yourself, how many sprinters would you see on the cover who is a black woman and? It's not the same black woman they've used all the time. You you must be able to talk to that a little bit more then. So like, like there is so much black excellence in running. Yeah. yeah. You would think that world was inundated. From that, the transition from trampoline to athletics, I definitely felt at home yeah, yeah. because I could see people like me around all the time. So people always assume that there's no racism in track and field, but it is. As you go up, there's obviously the less people on the boards, less people at the top, and mm -hmm. like you only see us on the ground. That's mm -hmm. as far as we can get. So it's all like, how will, it, will that ever change? Will it change? You ask us, are we going to be on magazines? I highly doubt it. Where we can only go so far. I think with black people, that they're only going to give us an inch. They're never going to give us a mile. They're not going to just let us be free, let us be ourselves. Because even still to this day, I still question, can I still bring up certain things? Can I talk about that? I, can only, I still have to pick my battles. I haven't let loose and said to everyone, like, I'm done, I'm sick and tired of it. If anyone's going to ask me a question, I'm going to answer it raw and make them understand the uncomfortability that I felt throughout my whole entire life. Mm -hmm. But then, no, you still feel like, oh, I still can't do this, I still can't do that. But being um, a black sprinter, I feel like it's okay. But before, when I mentioned, like, for us, okay, the sprinters, are predominantly black. Mm -hmm. And with track and field, which is a good thing, if you're not fast enough, you're not making the team. Mm -hmm. So it's not like yeah. they're going to pick you. Oh, Objective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, yeah. You look all right, we'll have you or this. No, if you don't pass the <laughs> Your post. Your time is your time. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We're not going to carry a slow person until we're to Olympics. Mm -hmm. So obviously, uh, the whole of our relay team is now black. Like, yeah, it's black. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> when, when, okay, when, as you got to the four by fours, it starts to change, but the sprinting is all black. So when I'll never forget there was a there's a podium post with Jamaican America and we were all black. Mm. And then we just got like there was those of pros and there was those of like con comments, just like everyone was not respecting the fact that how we all black, this and the other, this should be black Britain. We don't like this. Da, 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 da. So, well, I'm sorry, you're just not fast enough. That's how it goes in our sport. Like, yeah. if you don't cross the line first, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not going to make it. But people don't seem to understand that they shouldn't. It's, why are we presenting just Black Britain up there? Why? Yeah. Why is it not culture? That's a well. Say that. That's what I don't want to say it, but you already sport. know, kind of thing. Yeah. So because it's obviously my sport's judged. So mm. you're always trying to be oh. like you, so you, is that, you're that, that area of yeah. conjecture. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So. If I could be the best, but might not actually get the best score, mm. so it's it's a bit weird mm. in that in that instance. It's so, crazy. I remember so, having those conversations. Like, yeah, I guess you kind of trying to be portrayed a certain mm -hmm. way, mm. so that you, <laughs> I guess, so that you get the score you deserve. And do you, and do you feel like that has worked against you in the past? Definitely, I've definitely I've had it both sides. I've had both sides of the coin. I've had times where I feel like I've got birthdays, and. I've had athletes tell me, oh, you got a birthday today. Like, <laughs> and I've had it the other side of the coin where I feel like I've been robbed. So I guess it, it's just, I guess it's the game. It's yeah. the game. But yeah, I feel like the way that you've got that and you can just literally be fastest person, you, mm -hmm. you're in the team kind of thing. That's such a good way of having it. I think that's the most, it's comfortable. Yeah. Because I do understand if you're being judged constantly with like, we already, like you said, we're judged just, on appearance, you like you can't you don't judge a book by its cover. Everyone always says that, but instantly with a black person, that's what you're doing. Like, mm. ooh. like when yeah. you get into a, oh, the funny story was in Japan, and like you don't always um, get racism everywhere you go, mm. but I do. I notice it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were all of us like the relay girls were in the lift. And then the lady, I, to be fair, this is the first time I experienced it in Japan. She walked in and she went, oh, 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 and then she hid. And like, where are you going in the lift? You can't hide. <laughs> she tried her best. And then she turned around and she just stood there like this and she just couldn't believe it. And then the lift um, stopped and then she just ran out. 
That's what. Oh, that is Jesus. Jesus. We do it all the time. Everywhere we go, some people even this, they look at the lift. No, I'll wait. Or like, oh, yeah. like look at us. Like, oh, maybe, yeah, maybe you should get out. Mm -mm. I would say first, like you always feel, like, I'm, I'm, sometimes you just get tired of it, but you just roll your eyes because it's, oh, another day in being black. Basically. Also, if there's one crew you don't want to try and run away from, it's the, yeah. the relay team, Because <laughs> yeah. like, they can stay with you if they need yeah. to. <laughs> no, endurance is, or my endurance. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't last that for 100 meters. Yeah, okay, guys, I'm done. You take the rest. Yeah. That's crazy. It'll be yeah, interesting that's... to know, so, about with climbing, is, is, is it judged on, on how quick you are or...? So there's three disciplines within climbing that will be in the Olympics. One is speed, so basically like a vertical yeah. 15 metre race. Sick. And then you've got bouldering and lead climbing, which are a bit more like you have to get to the top and then you're awarded a top. But they're, they're, I mean, there's no room for any subjective like okay. yeah, decisions in there. So it's similar to Asha, it's like... Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's some room for like, it gets very complicated, but like if you step on something you're not supposed to, or if you didn't hold the top hold mm -hmm. for long enough in control, but that's like, there's so many other judges that will have a look at it. Mm. I feel like it's hard to be like discriminated against in mm. a competition, really. It'll be interesting to, I mean, someone as someone who's in London and Germany, what is it like? I'm generally the only one, and I had years in youth competitions where people would touch my hair. Have you ever had that? Oh, of oh, course. Wow. It's like, yeah. oh, it's so soft. I know. I love it. And I'm like, I know you're you're trying to come from a good place, but like, I'm not, I'm not a doll. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't touch yeah. me. Or I'm like, oh, I wish I had your hair. It's like, and you know, they're trying to be nice. And I think that that's most of the racism I receive nowadays. Mm. Like, it's from people I love and care about and they just, they just don't know that it's like offensive or like that mm. it takes something away from me every time and that like, I don't appreciate you touching my hair or like, gosh, I'm darker than you, aren't you supposed yeah, to be mixed get, race? Yeah, I'm like, I've been on holiday, you look almost yeah. the same colour now. All the time, yeah. I'm like, please don't <laughs> question like mm. who I am. Like I, I struggled enough with my identity when I was younger, like I straightened my hair, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to spend too much time in the sun because mm -hmm. I'd be like black, dark, yes. so dark. Yeah. And people would be like, whoa, like, weren't you white 10 minutes mm. ago? And I'm yeah. like, and I was called like a double white Oreo, like mm. white on the outside, oh. white on the inside, mm. like the, the golden bounty. one. Mm. Bounty, mm -hmm. bit yeah. of coconut oh. in there. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I even had people be like, don't you have like cocoa butter in your skin? Jesus. I was like, what? cocoa butter in my skin. Yeah. I'm not a plant. Wow. Like, <laughs> wow. So I've had like, it's all things like that. Or like, oh, does your dad make great jerk chicken? Yeah. It's like, no. it's chicken. It's always what always is this chicken. fascination with always being chicken? chicken? I know, and it's just like things like that where they're like being curious and they don't, they're like, how can you be mad at me? I'm just asking a question. And it's like, no, but this is offensive. And it's like, you're only asking this because mm -hmm. I'm not white. So, did you, so would you say that to them or not? So. I've kind of had a like, over the last few years, I've really got better at accepting who I am. Like I'm trying to bring out more of my blackness. So I wear my hair out. I remember the first time I wore my hair out in a big like, mm -hmm. just out and at a competition, everyone was like, oh my God, your hair goes like that. And I was mm -hmm. like, why do people need to say anything? But like, they call it my diva hair or something. Uh, and I'm like- It's just your hair. It's <laughs> just my hair. It's like, <laughs> exactly, it's not a statement. It's just like who I am but I've really started to accept who I am. And, and now like after even this year, it's only taken till this year, I will speak up about something that upsets me that I am against, even if it's like sexism, racism, I will not hold back now because I held back for so many years, mm -hmm. just trying to fit in, mm -hmm. not upset people because I, I don't know, I didn't want to like make a scene or anything. And now mm. I'm over it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah, over it. Me chest now. So you, were, so you were saying the same thing when we were walking down here, right? Yeah. Sim similar kind of thing. So educate me on that, right? So is that because the fact that you've taken that stand that you said only this year did you come out with, you know, really forthcoming with who you are mm. on YouTube or whatever else. Is that a thing where after X amount of years, you go, you know what, forget this, I'm not trying to fit in anymore. I'm going to be, you know, more honest with myself and others about who I am and what I find disrespectful and so on and so forth. Or w is it because there's been like a bit of a societal shift mm. and that's what you feel like as, as a, sort of the straw that broke the camel's back and you're like, okay, now I'm not going to stand for this anymore. I think that's helped a lot. The society I thing. think um, I gave up a long time of trying to please people because yeah. I realised in life, that's not, I was not made here to make you smile. <laughs> I'm here for myself and mm -hmm. I think that's how I had to because I'm, I'm a bold character I'm a very open and I like to have fun and people always feel that as a tim intimidating or like she's always aggressive 
nice as well. If that's what, is that how you feel? Because at the end of the day, I, I'm okay. Everyone else around me is smiling. You just feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it gets to a point where now this George Floyd thing has happened. It's like it's brought so much awareness for people to check themselves when they're mm -hmm. asking us a question. Check yourself when you want to touch my hair and say, ask me all these things. Oh, you, your skin's like this. Do you do this? I said, yeah. Who ask? Like, educate yourself because people don't know how to. There's, you've got the ignorant people, oh, there's no racism or that and the other, but they don't empath empathise with us, and mm -hmm. I think that's what they need to do, because they don't yeah. understand what we've been through this whole time. Now you've seen a man hold his, um, his nail on his neck for how, how many minutes. Now you understand that's how we feel constantly. Mm -hmm. I can't walk into a room and be myself. I know for a fact, even to this day, I'll probably still it, because I just got to assess first before I relax. Yeah. And that's all we've got to do. I can't come and say, oh, what, go on or whatever. I can't be saying that. <laughs> yeah. I say, oh, hello, you know. Yeah. You're, 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 you're. Yeah. So you have to, be, have to, you have to really yeah. say something. You have to really be OK with who I'm talking to first before I can say it, because if the whole George Floyd didn't thing happen, didn't happen and there wasn't a big, massive, um, worldwide um, situation, we would have still been in our shells. Mm -hmm. And I tell you this now, we could only go so far. We'll never take you over the edge. Like I said, in certain situations, if I see it, I would bring it up, but I wouldn't go too hard. And I'll have to go home and call my aunt or my family and say, oh, you never guess what. And I have to run. When I tell you, I have to run and get off my chest so I can finish and then go see you the next day. Because if I didn't get off my chest, you're going to feel it's it the next close. day. Yeah. yeah. Cause it's Same for you guys. Yeah. I was going to say, I think it's always a conscious decision because one point that my dad always makes to me is that the, like, the racist mentality is not just within racists, it can also like, be within black people as well. So mm -hmm. it can be a thing where black people don't think that they're good enough or black people yeah. um, mm -hmm. see other black people who are darker than them or have more kinky hair than them and see them as lesser Colorism. than. So that mm -hmm. racist mentality yeah. actually seeps its way mm -hmm. into the black community. Mm -hmm. And yes, we have to fight the battle of racism coming in from other places. But we also need to eliminate the, the racism and colorism within our own community Absolutely, because yeah. if we don't get rid of that, then there could, because most of the time, like for example, for me, I'm interacting with other black people a lot of the time because of the area that I'm from, but there can still be that, that racist mentality in there because it's been something that's been, you know, seeped into the community essentially. So that's also another thing that we have to try and work out of our community. And it's been something that has been put there by the racist in the first place in order to like keep us down. So it's something that we have to actively work against to get to the point where we see our, we mm -hmm. actually see ourselves as equal to someone else. Because like you said, when, like, when you were younger and you were like straightening your hair and stuff like that, that was probably like your own mentality mm -hmm. that because all the girls you were seeing had straight hair, mm -hmm. you felt like you had to be the same as that. But it's, it's something that you had to embrace yourself. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's another it thing. It sounds like it was going back to what Obi was talking about with his pops being like, you're going to speak English, mm -hmm. yeah. no Nigerian accent mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Yeah. Almost as though to be closer to you know, British yeah. was in some way yeah. better. Yeah. That sounds like if a similar white, kind of thing. Your class is better. You, that's how society is. You have to act yeah. white, be white. Exactly. You have to be, you can't be yourself. You can't be with your afro running out. You can't have, um, what is it? You said you have, you have, well, you, Jamaican people have their long nails. Like, yeah. You have to mm. act a certain mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And to mm -hmm. be accepted, you have to You have to speak posh. You, have to, you can't walk with a, a bop or whatever they say we walk mm -hmm. with or something. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You have to be perfect. We can't be ourselves as soon as we open the door. There is a new character that we, we create for ourselves of when we've entered into the world. But when you come home, you take off your jacket, then you can relax. But as soon as I walk out the door, I'm already put on a, a different act. I can't ever be myself. And do you feel like, I suppose we're, 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 we're very much focusing on black traditions now, but do you feel like you're seeing changes there? Because like we just talked about Chunks and Philly, right? Soccer Aid a few years back would have been, uh, you know, Robbie Williams, Gordon Ramsay, right, these sorts of names. To see Chunks and Philly on there being very unapologetically themselves, mm -hmm. do you see light at the end of the tunnel? Do you see things starting to change a little I, bit? I think it's not going to happen overnight, definitely, because mm. um, like you said, you've got to work on ourselves first because mm -hmm. we've been suppressed for too many years. But there's always that exception first. And then slowly we might be getting, but then again, they, they could be the only two and we still might not get them. Um, like the the yeah, like yeah, exactly. You're not going to yeah. get the seat at the table. You're still, you're, I'm going to still be the head, but mm -hmm. you guys are just going to be, every mm -hmm. now and then I'll, I'll bring you in. But yes. that, until we're not at the top, it's never going to change. Yeah, yeah. So we could, they can only give us small handouts. How do, how, do we cha how do we change that though? Because I'm like, we're sitting, so again, mentioned it at the start and I said it on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a board member at Gymshark, but I'm proud to say we don't have a all male board or an all white board. Mm -hmm. That's not to say, if you looked at our board, there's, there's definitely uh, similarities. There is white males on there and whatever else, and we, we've got a way to go for sure. But I'm, it, to be honest, I'm just proud to say, with the way that most boards look these days, mm -hmm. proud to say that we're not all male and proud to say that we're not all white, right? But 
How do you think, because I'm, I'm asking because I think maybe if you have ideas about how we can change your sport, we might be able to do the same thing. How do we advance that position? How do we, in your sport, do you think there's certain things we can do to improve that that Gymshark might be able to learn from as well? Well, I don't feel, well, we don't see it. Like I said, um, to be honest, if I didn't go to the offices to notice, there was only a, a number of black people in British Athletics. So mm -hmm. it's like you say, if I don't see it, I won't ever know. Okay, so, so they can hide behind their website, yeah, their logo, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, there's always that, because like when our faces are never our forefront. You will never be the face of anything. And if it is, it will only be there for a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. And then you'll have to take it down and say, okay, that, we've had your fun now. Like, I don't feel like, to, to be honest, when you're a black person, you make it to the top, it's hard. Because now that you're here, like I said, you have to still act a certain type of way. Yeah. And even if another yeah. black person walks in, you can't be seen talking to that person because everyone's going to assume, oh yeah, you two black people, of course you'll talk to each other. So there's always that, that divide that you, you still can't be comfortable. And then when you try and help someone get in, it's like, I'm here trying to stand on my own two feet before I can even there try to help you. Mm. And that's another thing that we can never, we can't, they always say that black people are like crabs, but it's not, it's just the fact that we can't like it's, crabs. Yeah, because you know how crabs, crabs trying to get book. over like crabs a, in the bucket. Yeah, yeah, crabs in the bucket. They always pull, pull someone down. down. Yeah. yeah, and we've always been. That's in the black community how we be always class each other. But it's only because now I've made it. I don't want to fall back down into that bucket. And it's not like I, we want to give you a helping hand. It's just I don't know how long I'm gonna last yeah. it for. And that's how it always it always it's is. It's what Obi said in that. It's almost like an invisible quota because there was those two guys, right? And now. If someone else is trying to come up, they're almost thinking oh, our positions might be threatened. Mm -hmm. So that's where the kind of crabs in the bucket thing oh, comes, really? comes from. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, we're here, but if you come here, we might have to leave mm. because they're, they're only going to let two of us oh, be yeah. here. Wow. So, yeah, it's a similar thing. Yeah, it, it is. Um, and then when you, oh, this always makes me laugh because then ignorant people, I would say, would always go, what about Oprah? <laughs> I'm like, okay, one, <laughs> one example, well done, yeah. um, name another one. And then you do have some, like Tyler Perry now, who's another one. Yeah. Okay, two, well done. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, it's like, oh, this. So, so, now I refuse to sometimes. There was Christmas adverts, a lot of them now are diverse. I noticed this. Yeah. White people don't notice this, yeah, I yeah. notice. Yeah. We notice when we, we see notice, ourselves yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I noticed yeah. last Christmas, <laughs> the loads of mixed families. And then there was the Sainsbury's one. And then I read the comments like an idiot. And then it's like, oh, they're trying to shove it down our throats. Yeah. Oh, there's all this, this woke and PC. And I remember speaking to my friend and I said to him, uh, I remember also the James Bond thing, 007, where she's yes. going to be a black woman. Mm. And they're okay. like, oh my God, they changed. Obviously 007 is different to James Bond. It's not mm. the same thing. 007 is the agent. Mm. And they're shoving it down our throats. They're turning everyone black and, did, did that, and women. And I said to him, I listed like 20 movies and I was like, look at the poster, look at the people in there. And they've just put one black woman yeah. and you, you think that's shoving it down your throat. Out of 30 movies, it's just one with a black person and you think that's shoving it down your throat. And that's the problem is because of companies are trying to change, but then I feel like uh, because my friends are white, I have to educate them and say to them, this is not an attack on you. We're not trying to remove you. They're just trying to include okay. us. When you say you're shoving it down and throat, and I'll be like, well, there's, okay, let's watch 20 adverts right now and let's mm -hmm. see how many white people compared to black people. But they don't look at it that way. They just see a movie and they've seen that, oh, this black woman is 007. Oh, it's woke. And I remember Black Panther as well. Oh, why is it it's all black, black people? Cars. That's racism. Yeah, yeah. It's all black people. What if they did all white people and someone was like, okay, yeah. uh, Captain <laughs> Marvel, <laughs> like, yeah. Captain yeah, America. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's the same with modeling when Naomi Campbell was trying to change it when yeah. they had to have diversity. And then people were like, oh gosh, now they try, you know, what if we go, oh, we only want to have all white models and someone showed them uh, Prada's one way. And Prada, I remember there was a news thing because, you know, Naomi was talking about it, how Prada used a black model for the first time in years. Mm -hmm. And this was news. And when you show people this example, they don't, that, that's actually when they realize. And then some of my friends are like, oh wow, I didn't know this. One of my, one of my mates, for example, I had to explain about the airport situation, traveling <laughs> yeah. as an immigrant. So this is why I go ignorant. So, oh yeah, let's go to Paris. Uh, let's go that. to Paris tomorrow. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I need two weeks notice <laughs> and I need to show my 
tax return, my bank statement, <laughs> my five years address. Leave, leave, talk more about me because I know there'll be a lot of people who will watch this. Yeah. You guys understand, yeah. right? But there'll be a lot of people watching this going, what? What yeah. do you mean? Why, why yeah. have we got to show up? Um, it's, it's funny because when La Bomba joined, and, and I was talking to La Bomba, I like, yeah, yeah, I'll be in mm. the same situation. So when, it's, um, when we have to travel, I can't just do, yeah, let's go for a weekend getaway in there. Even though I have an indefinite leave to remain in the UK, other countries don't care. They see it as I'm st I am still an immigrant with a, Niger with a Nigerian passport. That's even mm. a run another red flag. As soon as they see Nigeria, it's like, we want your whole life history. Um, I remember laughing because going to Dubai back in the day, everyone could apply online. And the one country missing was Nigeria. No Even Timbuktu was on the list. <laughs> <laughs> That's how bad it is. And I remember being so angry being Nigerian. Honestly, I've been, I remember speaking to George, I missed out on going to Wadapalooza because my interview for the American visa was remember, way past yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. I was so angry. Every time I look at that passport, I'm so angry. And- When you look at your I'm, passport, you're angry. Yeah, it makes me so annoyed. And just because, it brings me down to feeling like I'm less than everyone else. Mm -hmm. When my friends can all, I remember we were going to Sweden and um, yeah, my friend, we were going, so we were walking to customs and yeah, my mate just went through the normal one and then the queue for international oh, yeah. passports and he had to wait for 20 minutes. He was like, what are you waiting for? I was like, I, I have to go through this. And then we mm -hmm. got to Norway and the guy was there. And I remember that was the first time I saw a gun. So the guy had the, the customs there, they have a gun. The yeah. guy was sitting there with a gun. He was looking at my passport, looking at me. Yeah. Like, where are you going? Where are you from? You've lived in the UK, how long? How come you've you know, you've been there for this long? Even though my indefinite leave is on there. Yeah, like yeah. you can see it. It's like, how come you've been there for this long? And um, every time, so some of my mates who are white don't know this. Every time I come into the UK, they ask me the same question, even though it's on my record all the time. Where have you been? How long were you there? Why were you there? What were you doing there? What's your job? And with them, they're just like, la, 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 la. Yeah, yeah, see you later. Mm -hmm. And this is where I always uh, explain what privilege is. This, I always find it's nicer to explain it this way because people always think you're attacking them when you say white privilege. Well, of course, I know even though you're black, you, you're born here, so you have a British passport. Mm -hmm. But a lot of white people wouldn't think First of all, you know, when you go on holiday, you would never think, oh, I make, better make sure that like, as a black person, I can go to this place. Mm. Yeah. When you explain it that way, they understand it. Yes, some black people do have privilege. In a way, I do have privilege. I'm mm. sponsored, I don't, you know, I go to the supermarket, I can buy organic without double thinking. That's privilege. <laughs> when I have to explain to, that, to people that way, they're like, okay, I get it. But then when you explain, explain to people how, as a white person, you can go to certain situation, you don't have to code switch. What does that, Americans call it code switch. So like you were saying, like, you know, mm. with your street slang, but when you go to a job interview, you wouldn't dare do that. Mm. Yeah. You might have your braids, but when you go to an interview, you might take out your braids. Mm. Mm -hmm. But as a white person, you would never, you would never, would you even dare go with an Afro to an interview, a corporate yeah. interview? Hell no. Even if you Google like professional hairstyles, no black person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I have to tie my hair back, mm. make sure if I got a wig on, relaxed hair, something. That's how I couldn't be yeah. myself. Like, as long as you tie back, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, my dad's always said, be, t be twice as good. Yeah. Exactly, everyone, yes. Um, know your room, know who's in the room. Like, so when you're having to think of things like this all the time, like, it, it's going to like beat you up eventually, isn't mm. it? So. Don't look angry. Yeah. My mom always says, don't look angry. Smile. Um, we're quite. Oh, she's quite old-fashioned, so it's like, yes, sir, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, sir. Obviously, you don't do that. But um, you get told how to behave, and when this um, rush, yeah. the the wind rush thing wind happened, rush. Yeah. that scares me even now. Well, those people, are grandparents now. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. they have indefinite leave, but the problem is they didn't renew it, and yeah. I have indefinite leave, and I'm like, Jesus, can they really just send me back? Like, yeah. and you know, my mum is like. You better be behaving yourself because, you know, everyone goes, oh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. And I'm like, no, nah, see, this is why, this is, again, when, when I always say you have that privilege to be like, oh, you'll be fine. No, nah, mm. you have your British passport. Mm. I think there are some black people who are hyper cynical, who just think like everything that happens to them happens to them because they're black. Mm -hmm. But then there are some situations where it is and there's some situations where it isn't, but you won't necessarily know. But it's difficult whether you go into a situation being more cynical, like, yeah, it was probably because I was black, or you go in there with an open mind, like, oh, was it just because of X, Y, Z? And you don't necessarily know, but 
it's, it's, t it's difficult to think of like what your mindset should, mindset should be because you can get to a point where you get really angry about a lot of things and that makes it even worse because mm -hmm. then that's just how you go out in the world and it's not like productive really just to be really angry all the time. So you kind of got to you know, just think about your mindset and things like that. So I think that's also important for black people just to like think about how they, they view the world, how they got outside into the world because it's really easy to be just really angry and necessarily bitter mm -hmm. if um, you've had like tough situations and things that have happened to you but that's it's going to be hard to help you in that situation so yeah it's tough to like change your mentality after a lot of things happen to you you have an extremely mature and uh extremely mature outlook on that and a, and a, and a, and a, a real ability to look like introspectively i feel like because mm. two things he's mentioned so far was he said we have a problem in the black community and he talked about the whole light skin dark skin mm -hmm. drama and that situation yeah. mm -hmm. then you talked about people being over cynical that's, I, I, feel, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like that's a rare quality, right? To be able yeah. to look <laughs> introspectively because it's, it's so much easier, I feel like, obviously to go, the problems are external, and they are, right? Yeah. Um, but how, how have you, is, is that something your dad's giving you, your parents giving you? It's, like? it's a, lot, a lot to do with my parents. I have a lot of conversations with my parents about these topics. Because your dad's a bit of a, I feel like, your dad's like a bit of a, um, I, I've, I've done my background recently. Uh, your, recent. your dad's mm -hmm. C-suite. Uh, another company, isn't he? He's like a CIO. He's a CIO like at St. Mary's. So he's a he's a like if if I was you, he's a bit of an icon to look up to personally. Like he's yeah. a black, black man sitting on a board, which obviously yeah. um, we don't see a lot of. Um, so is that is that is that coming down from him? Well, yeah, it's most of it comes from my dad because when we talk about racism, you always want to have something that productive that you can actually do, like. It's, it's good to have the conversations about all the things that are happening to you, but then where do you go from there? You actually, you've still got to live your life. You've still got to, you know, be a good person. You've still got to try and strive for the best. So it's good to look at the things that you personally can do. And if there are things with our own community, because it's tough to change other people, but there's all, all, always things you can do to yourself. Mm -hmm. You can change your mentality. You can change your outlook. So he focuses a lot on that because, like, he's had some really tough racist experiences. He was shopping with his friends. Some police officers just literally rocked up threw every racist word in the book at them, slapped them in a police van, and it was only because like um, a local MP was literally walking by at the time that he was able to get them a really good lawyer and they were able to get out of that situation. But he, he doesn't necessarily always look at like, those situations with bitterness, but he looks at like what, what he can do to his own mentality and things like that. So I think it's what he's passed that down to me and that's, that's where I kind of got that from. Mm -hmm. So yeah. It's, 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 but I'm, I'm proud of you at 17 years old that you can do yeah. that, do you know what I'm saying? Because I'm not sure I would have that same yeah. ability to be introspective. I think I'd be just super angry at the rest of the world, do you know what I'm saying? I feel like because our parents have been through so much mm. yeah. that they don't put it on us. Because mm -hmm. when you talk about older people, so my grandma's 102 now, wow. 103. Wow. And I know, <laughs> Shout genes. out to grandma. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember they always tell us a story that she tried to buy a house, uh, this is in Wolverhampton, she tried to buy a house in like say the corner house or whatever. And they said, no, she can't because she's black. And my aunt went to a school when she was brought up, she was the only black person and she wasn't allowed to go into their house because she was black. So all the kids would go outside your play and when you're tired and want to drink, you'd go inside. She wasn't never allowed to go inside. So there's all these things that my family have been through. They tell us these things. Mm -hmm. So they make us feel like, yeah, okay, be aware, but we can't live in the show and like mm -hmm. hide yeah. away. We have to, like, so you can't change anyone because they're not, um, that's, that's not under your control. But the things that you can control, you could change and live a better life. So if we held on to it for so long, like that anger, we wouldn't get anywhere. No, so you'd have to let it go. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I said, me, I can't hold anything on my chest. I get, like mm -hmm. I said, I've actually got 24 hours to be angry, but the next yeah. day comes, you're not <laughs> yeah, carrying it again. Yeah. So yeah. you get it off your chest and you move forward. Mm. But if we used to ha carry, like say my grandparents stuff, I mean, we're already carrying enough. Mm. And then to add all that on top, we'll, we'll, we'll just drown. Yeah. But you'd have to yeah. be able to stand on your own two feet, yeah. see the world in a better light because if we thought it was too dark, we would never get out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's exactly how I feel as well. It's just, I mean, I did a YouTube video kind of discussing when the whole George mm -hmm. Floyd and Black Lives Matter, just took my viewpoint. And I'm not necessarily angry. And I feel like, like some, some, even in the comments, were like, we feel like you're just pandering. It's just like, it's just how I feel. I just feel like rather than me being angry, I want to enjoy my life because life's too short. Mm -hmm. And also getting older, I've just realized that what's the point of being angry all the mm -hmm. time? And some people prefer to be shouty and preachy, fine, but I wanted to make my own social media and stuff more, more fun and positive and so people to come and enjoy because there is still, we can still live a, a great positive life as all of us sitting here can attest to that 
you know, yes, there are, there are things that have happened, but we still have a life that's, let's be honest, it's, it's some people would love to have. Yeah, 100%. You know? yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Some people would, would I, I still get people messaging me going, I, you know, I, I wish I can do what you do. You know, I don't like my job and things like that. So I think in retrospect, we sh yes, we do need to have a discussion. We need to try and find a way to change things. But I also feel like being angry all the time is, you know, I hate that with that chip on your shoulders because mm -hmm. that's what people use against us when we mm -hmm. do things like this. Try and undermine your argument. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's why it's good to have that perspective of we're, we're not angry, we just wish that things would change mm -hmm. and maybe there is a way that things would change and we can educate people. But at the same time, we are privileged to do what we are doing. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. Yeah. You know, so. Like you said, grandparents and parents would probably love to have the experience you guys have right now. Right? Absolutely. Compared, to, compared yeah. to what they oh, had and the treatment yeah. they received. Yeah. It's a whole other ball game now, right? But on the subject of change, I'm gonna throw it to you two for a second, and this is a big question, so bear with me. <laughs> um, the fact we're all sitting here today having this conversation, right, is, mm -hmm. You know, conducive to change. I think that the strap line that the uh, Jim Shark creators came up with, it, but respecting the progress, like I'm sitting here today, like I feel genuinely privileged to have this conversation, to be able to have this conversation, to not feel awkward and all that kind of stuff. But how, what else do we do moving forward now? Do you know what I'm saying? From your guys' perspective, in sports, in YouTube, in brands, in society, do you guys have any other insight? Do you have any kind of ideas or things that you'd love that you'd love to see more of, and how we continue this progress? I just okay. <laughs> I think it's hard. I think everyone wants to see like massive change, and as Asha said, that's not happening overnight. Mm -hmm. So for me, what I really care about is everyone doing the little things that are like important to all of us, like making black people feel comfortable where you are. Don't look at them too long. Like, don't comment on something. Like, don't be like, oh, your hair looks funny today. I was like, that's just unnecessary, mm -hmm. and it's easy. And I always ask people to like go on Instagram. Everyone uses Instagram go and find some black like content creators or like influencers in the outdoors or go and find a black climber, follow them, follow their journey, like let them like use their platform like to inspire you and like share them, like help them build themselves to like be successful in what they want to do. And I feel like we can all do those little things without that costing anyone any energy or like, you know, we don't have to like, I feel like the change needs to come from up and beneath like the big change maybe we don't have as much influence on but mm. all the little mm. things like I think there is no reason people can't make those changes in their own lives yeah like there's there's definitely been change from like my parents and grandparents because I've heard stories from my, my dad for example he said he was in primary school and another kid said to him oh you're a soap dodger mm. and he's he's gone home he was fostered by a white family and he, he had no idea what that even meant so he said to his mom Oh, what what does that mean? And she just started crying, like she couldn't even explain it to him. And I, I shouldn't be made to feel lucky that I haven't had that, mm -hmm. had that kind of experience like now. So like, it's th there's definitely been change. It, we just need to continue the change and use this year as, as a learning curve for everyone. And you know, there's things I've learned this year that I didn't know before. And I'm sure that everyone in this room could say that. So it's definitely just a case of continuing that progress. Well, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. Like, Rochelle mentioned it to me. She said I can count on one hand the, you know, the black British females that I can look up to as role models. I think conversations like this prove that, like, I genuinely feel like you five are role models and can even further be role models and inspire so many young kids behind you. So hopefully more conversations like this, more content like this, the, the ability to break down what would have previously been awkward barriers and just and, you know, tell it how it is and talk about what needs to change is really, really key. So. I'm super happy that you guys all came and did this with us today. Obviously, we've been talking to you all individually about how Gymshark can help on individual journeys you might be on, right? No matter if you're hyper involved in, uh, you know, this kind of progress, if you're a bit more passive, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, thanks for all being here, guys. I uh, really appreciate no, it. No, wicked, thank you. Thank you. The um, Black History Month, uh, February in the USA, there's gonna be more Gymshark content coming around then, so I look forward to that. If you wanna hear more from, more from all these guys, their links will be in the description or the bio or the whatever else, whatever platform you're watching or listening to this on. Um, thanks for joining us. If you're, if you're a fan of Gymshark, if you're part of the Gymshark community, we really hope um, you support what we support.